group. And the first group is Roger Gico, who's going to report back. And the topic of that was normalization, individual variation, which we didn't really talk about, and multi data set integration, which we did. Roderick. Thanks. So I think it was a great section. I, I, I learned a lot about single cell and about normalization. So there were a number of topics that we addressed. I think it's like four ses, uh, sections. I will go one by one. The first is in um, QC and the standards. Uh, and the first question that we asked is uh, what is the criteria to use whether to include a cell in, a, in an experiment? And uh, criteria were actually, say, separated by criteria that you could use before sequencing and post sequencing. And uh, this includes, actually, I'm not seeing everything here. And the slide is cut, but anyway, uh, the time to lies of the cell, uh, imaging the cell looking from. So imaging of the cells, uh, so how the cell looks like using uh, even microscopy uh, or cell viability assays, and then things that you could use uh, after the sequencing, like for instance the mapping statistics, although this could be confounded by the amount of RNA in the cell, the number of genes expressed, and some other things that I cannot see here. Maybe I will see if I... Uh, and uh, yes, the pairwise cor uh, pair correlation between, between cells to detect outliers, so cells that behave un unexpectedly. I'm not sure we use other things because, yes, the amount of... Sorry, this is... Uh, maybe if I could go to the Google anyway, uh, because this is a Google Doc. Uh, amount of mitochondrial uh, RNA for some experiment. No, I know, but but it, it's cut all the all the all the many of the things are outside of the outside of the slides. Okay, okay, uh, yeah, okay. So then 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 the, uh, for some assays, for instance, for attack sec, it was suggested to do the aggregate uh, plots so that you see this aggregation of this enrichment in the TSSs. This may be difficult for RNA seq uh, tag based methods. Uh, this leads to the discussion of what actually is a good or what is a bad cell. And uh, there was a discussion of, about using the background, which uh, this could be confounded with ambient RNA. This is the RNA that uh, may be generated by the rupture of the, of the cells, and is much more common in cells that are unhappy. So there were several ideas that were put forward to, 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 to measure this effect, which is sequence actually the buffer where the cells have been, uh, uh, been kept. Uh, uh, sequencing the bulk tissue. This was uh, put together uh, as, a, as a, maybe even as a standard protocol. Uh, this may be difficult when you have a small, small po cell populations, but actually now even few cells, 20 to 30, are sufficient for a smart sec. Uh, the theory is should to do that before or after the dissociation, and this will depend on, on, what, on what we want to control. Uh, maybe the idea is that this should lead to some sort of the, standard protocols for, for the dissociation that would be tissue specific. Another, another approach, rather than sequencing the, 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 the bulk tissue, which is essentially uh, using this sort of the same, the same protocol or the same platform for, for, for getting your, your readout, is using uh, different platforms, uh, or actually making experiments with bad cells. But of course, then there is many ways of killing the cells, and the effect of killing the cells may be different in different, in different cell types. Uh, so it was proposed that maybe uh, uh, it could be really good to have some sort of reference, uh, so to have this idea of, of a set of good cells that we know how they behave, so that we could compare our results with the expected results in a population of cells that we know how it behaves, is to, to put together some sort of reference control uh, of cells in which uh, the, the abundance of the genes are known. The problem is, of course, when you have the cells in suspension, you don't know to what extent there is cross-talk between them. Also, it is populations of cells is preserved in different sites. There are different uh, preservation protocols or ways in which the cells have been kept. This may affect the cells. Uh, uh, so uh, there it has been the proposal, maybe, to create a resource with a mixture of cells that, that are shipped to different, and this is a pr proposal that has been put together by the Senac, so that this, this mixture of cells will be, will be shipped to different, different sites, it will be sequenced, and the results will be, will be com compared. And this, of, of course, leads to, to, 
problem that has been already addressed this morning is how we do define similarity between, between the cells, and this is an issue open for, for discussion. Um, then we address the issue of the metadata, so what sort of, of metadata do we need to keep for the experiments, and of course we have to learn from what has already been built during many years on the field of uh, gene expression in microarrays and, and RNA-seq, uh, but there will be many additional things that probably we will need to, to, to add to this, to this, to this uh, minimal uh, information that needs to be kept, for instance, information of the cell, the ischemic time, the surgical procedure to remove the, the tissue, uh, I think something which, and, uh, in particular, the anatomical side, so a good definition of what is the site within the, within the body from which the, the tissue has been resected and maybe even has been proposed to have some sort of ontology of a 3D organization of the, of the, of the human body. Another thing that's important, of course, is the phenotype of the donors. It's not the same the lung of a smoker than the lung of someone who is not a smoker, so this will have a large impact on the transcriptome of the cells. This needs to be recorded, and we learn a lot from the GTEx, the GTEx uh, project, in which there are a lot of phenotypic recordings of the individuals, and actually a lot of information that can be taken from the histological images and the pathological reports on the tissue sections. And I think that this is something that probably can be uh, can be of use within the human syllabus project. Then, of course, there are other things like the like the read number, uh, the quality of the RNA, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there was also uh, the, the discussion about uh, whether external data uh, not produced within the consortium should be, should be allowed to be included. Uh, and, and I think that the consensus when as, as long as, as it meets the uh, standards of the consortium, I think it should be okay. This means that these standards need to be in place uh, at many and many different levels. Uh, and, and there was this idea that this metadata is actually very important, so probably before accepting the data, there should be a pre-submission of the metadata to really assess whether the data was going to comply with the, with the HCA standards. Uh, then we talk about the types of data, although most of this is going to be RNA-seq and sequencing-based. There, there are other, there are other, uh, other data types, and one important thing is the, is the, is the images. So there is a, a compared to, to sequencing, there is a lack of standards uh, and agreed agree repositories for, for images. So we know when where to submit our, our sequencing data, our nucleotide sequencing, but when we have an experiment, it's very unclear where to submit our images. So there are some uh, uh, efforts in, in, in Europe. This is the Eurobioimaging, one of these uh, uh, S projects, large scale projects that involve many European countries. And there is also an effort within the EBI to create an image repository. Uh, we have to learn from other communities that have generated a lot of images from the medical community, of course, in order not to, not to reinvent the wheel. There were some, I don't know if it's here, cut it or not, there was some discussion about actually whether it was the need to keep the, to keep the, uh, the, the images uh, from, uh, from actually from the sequencing instrument. Uh, and and uh, it looks like that for some of the protocols that are being used, like a spatial, uh, spatial RNA, uh, I mean, of course, now nobody keeps the, 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 the Illumina images, right? Uh, there was a discussion at the, at, at the early in the years of the sequencing whether the images need to be kept or not, because new computational methods will lead to better uh, processing of the, of, the, of, the raw, of the raw image data. But this is still, well, for a standard uh, long RNA seq, this appears to be a solved problem. I mean, for some of these novel methodologies, still there is a, there is a, there is a some uh, rationale to keep the images, or at least part of the images, to see whether new computational methods can improve the base calling from the from the images. Um, so we talk about best practices, but mostly mostly this uh, this ambient RNA versus background, which I have already which I have already. Uh, address, so how can we actually measure the background, uh, uh, the bad RNA in, in, in the experiments, and how could we control for this? And then there was a discussion about, uh, about normalization, uh, and the first question was whether we, we should go for absolute versus relative expression. So most analysis so far are based on, on relative expression, and there was a discussion on whether uh, uh, that would be the good, uh, the good would, would be a, 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 the way to go. I mean, there was, of course, the, the, 
uh, the position that we are going for relative expression because this is what we could measure, not what this is, not this is what we wanted to measure, so we, we do what we can, not what we want. But uh, actually, absolute expression may be important for, for lowly expressions, which may have some stochastic variation. Uh, also, absolute expression gives maybe a better uh, view of the relationship between RNA and the downstream products, uh, products of RNA, like, like proteins. Um, so, to get really a good idea of what are these absolute levels, there was ideas of discuss. Uh, there was a number of ideas being discussed, like the use of controls, like spike-ins or housekeeping genes. But maybe, maybe, maybe the best in the, 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 the state of the art in the, in the field is actually to use uh, fish uh, for in particular target genes to, re to to get really a real count of the molecules in the cell and use this to normalize the readouts. Uh, I think there was the suggestion to, to develop maybe a really a good set of spike ins and this could maybe be a mandate of the HEA. So then on the issue of the normal of the of the normalization, I didn't have time to really to to put this very you now in uh, uh, very order, but I'll go with the, uh, on, on, on the notes that they have here. So there were different ways in which we, we could normalize the data, so there was a very radical uh, proposal actually to normalize on the entire universe of the HCI uh, data. Oh, because other types of normalization are not so not simple, right? So normalizing across cell type, we do know which is the cell type of the cells or across tissue, but across tissue there is a lot of tissue heterogeneity, across sequencing centers, across production labs, um, the other thing is this approach of your first cluster and then normalize according to the clusters and then scale, uh, set to keep the scale. Use rather than normalizations, use rankings uh, uh, based normalizations. And there was this issue of what, of course, there is not a good way of normalizing, that it will depend on what is your biological question or what is the domain uh, that you are going to, uh, to be interested in. So this maybe a good idea, but on the other hand, it's, it's very challenging from the, from the, in terms of actually developing uniform processing pipelines, because this requires some domain expertise, or someone that knows the problem that you want to attack, and this is very difficult to homogenize or harmonize across many different data sets. Uh, so any decision that's based, that's data-driven, I think it's in principle preferable from the, from the, from the data, let's say, production, or from the, from the data processing standpoint. Um, so there was this idea whether normalization um, uh, and, uh, and batch effect correction should be done simultaneously or should be done uh, 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 in a, in a, uh, doing first the normalization and then the batch correction. There were arguments or uh, situations in which you want to do one before the other. For instance, for differential expression, you may want to use the, 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 the confounding factors as covariates in your model, and then they are be taken into account already automatically. In some other places, it looks like it's better to do uh, this in an integrated way. Uh, and I think what is important, or this appears as important to some of the participants, is that uh, even though we normalize the data, the, the raw, the raw uh, data should be always be provided. Normalizing will be important for downstream analysis, but you always need to keep the rotate available. And this little bit has to do with, uh, with, uh, with the topic that we already addressed of having some sort of, of, of platform, uh, some sort of gold standard uh, in which the methods could be tested. This is very difficult, of course, so simulations are, are, a, are a, of course, an option and an option that should be explored with all the pros and the cons that simulations have. Uh, then there is this issue of creating this reference cell population uh, and how this cell population should be defined is, 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 an, open, is an open question. Um, then we had briefly at the end talking about versioning, and this is of course very important, uh, versioning both of the data. The releases are very important if you want to work on a common space so that everybody is working on the same release of the data. This is extremely important. We know how I mean, for those that have been working in projects like ENCODE and GTEx, uh, we know how complicated it is to shift your analysis from one release to the next. 
and how much additional computational effort is required when this is not taken into account. And also there is some uh, need for, uh, for versioning of the, of the methodology, which I, I wrote semantic version. I don't know what this meant here, but <laughs> this, the term was used in, on the discussion. And I think that that's what I have here. I think uh, John is here for answering all your questions. <laughs> I'm just reporting. <laughs> Questions for Rodrigue about what he talked about there? For John. Um, did you discuss what the features of this novel uh, spike in mixture might look like? I don't think that we discussed specifically the features of the, of the spike ins. We discussed a little bit this sort of reference cell population, whether it should have made from primary cells, from cell lines, whether it should be homogeneous or heterogeneous. But in, the, in terms of the spike-ins, I don't know, uh, John, I don't think we did we discuss, but maybe you had ideas, of course, I don't know. No, we didn't. I think that the, one of the challenges was the interplay between any potential spike and the endogenous population. And if they talk to one another, then the fact that you get a, a messed up signal that's a combination of your spike-in and the endogenous population. So there was felt to be some challenges there and maybe alternative, more technical standards might be a more appropriate way of handling it rather than shipping out samples that you would spike in in, in, the, in the sense of spiking in cells into the population of interest. I'd just like to make uh, one quick comment, um, which I guess I'm making on behalf of Cole Trapnell, had he been here, um, which is that even though RNA-seq is inherently a uh, a relative assay makes a relative measurement. Cole has an interesting paper recently where he points out that the, the, the sparsity of sequencing and the fact that there are so few transcripts in a single cell means that most of the transcripts are there in single copy. And he uses that observation to actually produce uh, absolute measurements of copy numbers of transcripts uh, from what is essentially a relative assay. It's an interesting paper and probably worth being looked at uh, by this community more carefully. Yeah, the, it's the census algorithm, I think, and it's, um, yeah, it is an interesting paper. It was in Nature Methods a couple of months ago. So for people who are interested in that, I think it's definitely well worth a look at. Uh, other questions? This is totally clear now. We all know how to normalize data. No hesitation. Oh, no, there are still some questions about normalization. Yeah, this is actually a comment more than a question is, I think, on the metadata, um, there's missing the conditions to lysis. So we heard from Dr. Sharma this morning on how things vary. So tracking what happened to that sample, you know, what temperature was stored at, what buffer, things like that, I think would be important. And then I think also uh, the dissociation, dissociation method and time uh, also relates to that. And uh, another comment is it might be also useful to do a bulk analysis of pooled single cells to use that as a, one of your controls. Yeah, we discussed the thought of using the bulk control and there was, some people thought that this was a good idea. There was a question about whether we should use um, genuinely on the bulk dissociation, or at the dissociated population or just a genuine slice of the tissue as the bulk control, and, or both, yes, depending upon what you're trying to recover. Sorry, okay, one comment. Maybe I misinterpreted this, did I? I, I don't know, but I understood that actually it would be a good recommendation to whatever the population is. If it's a sorted subpopulation, then one should do bulk. If it's directly for all cells from tissue, then one should also do a bulk. So I, I thought there would be a, was a kind of consensus that to each single cell data set, there should be a bulk going with it, which is, which, which would be an important recommendation if we start producing HCA data, right? And given the amount of effort it would take, it might be a good idea, but... I... The, the issue, I think, that was, I think that this was more or less the conclusion, but there was also the issue that the, if you have very small cell populations that you want to assay, you may not have enough cells for the bulk. But then, of course, now it looks like you can have bulk for very few cells, so... I guess that you if you could, couldn't do but one cell, then I mean, of course, if you just have 500 cells and that's all there is, but that will be the 
a rare case, wouldn't it? Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank Rodrigue for summing that up well.